So you know that kills people. It absorbs oxygen. That's just nonsense. Dangerous nonsense as well. It's just bonkers. Over 5G. There is no virus in my eyes because everywhere they're turning on 5G is where this so-called virus is coming now. I've had concerns over 5G for over four or five years now. The vast majority of scientists think think that it's safe. They don't, they don't. They don't. That's what the media are telling everybody. whether you think or whether Q has said they are involved in this human trafficking. Hillary Clinton? Yes. Barack Obama? Yes. George Soros? Yes. Michelle Obama? Yes, I This is no coincidence, right? I mean, who, who do you think is behind these caravans? A lot of speculation that it's George Soros. Do you, do you believe that? So have affiliates who are getting money from the Soros-occupied State Department and that is a very great concern. I can't help but think that the Democrats, uh, perhaps Soros, others may be funding this. Imagine in most countries. Um, you know. I'm Peter York, President of the Media Society. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have you been wondering recently about whether you should be vaccinated against the virus when it becomes available soon? Have you heard rumours about it being part of a big plot to control people? with injected microchips, care of Bill Gates? Have you heard about QAnon, an American theory about pedophile cannibals? Top people in the Democratic Party, media celebrities, civil servants, who are engaged in a huge child trafficking ring. It's believed by tens of millions of Americans. Do you worry about the possible connection between 5G and coronavirus. All these are the subjects of widely known conspiracy theories that have people across the West very worked up, either as believers, because they think other people are trying to hush them up, the, the stories they don't want you to hear is the familiar line, or as people who consider conspiracy theories a dangerous and divisive and that they're spread deliberately to confuse and demoralize people. How to treat conspiracy theories is a huge responsibility for media of all kinds. It couldn't be more current. Just look at America and the election, or more urgent with vaccination coming up. We've got a brilliant panel to discuss all this with a variety of insights from different perspectives. One of them speaking from New York, a first for us about her experience of a QAnon believer. And here to introduce them is our brilliant chairman, James Ball, global editor of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. James. So good evening, everyone. Uh, just to sort of set the scene and get a little backdrop. So oh, I was going to share a video with you, but apparently we have it disabled by our admin. So. Always good to uh, start with some technical uh, flaws. I will say that uh, someone conspired against us, uh, and in this case, it's clearly big tech. Um, so I will skip the video and introduce our panel. We have an absolutely fantastic panel tonight. I'm genuinely looking forward to speaking to them. We have John Nocton, who is an observer, columnist, and academic. He is a research fellow at CRASH which is the very uh, nicely acronymed Centre for Research in the Art, Social Sciences and Humanities at Cambridge University. 
we have Mariana Spring, who is a specialist disinformation and social media reporter at BBC News. So we have James O'Brien, who is an LBC talk show host, uh, who I'm sure you know very well, and of course, an author of several books on how to be right and how not to be wrong. And I very nearly said those the wrong way around, which would not <laughs> be great. Um, and finally, we have Bronte Lord, who is a producer with uh, CNN in New York, covering innovation, space and technology, but more recently, following a longtime believer in QAnon as he emerged from the cult and looked at kind of the wreckage it had left behind of his and his family's life. So just so that we know the format for this evening, I'm going to sort of ask each panelist an introductory question, and then we will spend sort of about 15, 20 minutes between us chatting back and forth some of the implications of what's going on with the sort of world and the conspiracies among this sort of real world pandemic and the digital one accompanying it. And then we will have about 20 minutes, I hope, for your questions. Now, these will come through the chat on Zoom. So please feel free to drop them in as soon as you have them. You can ask questions to everyone or to specific panelists. Um, and I will then ask them for you because otherwise on a Zoom call with 100 people, it does not go well. Um, but to kick us off and sort of for opening questions with each panelist, I'm going to uh, turn to Mariana first. And Mariana, you've reported on the types of people who spread misinformation and what their different motivations are. Can you tell us a bit about that and what you think it means for journalists working in this environment? Absolutely. I spend a lot of my time investigating uh, both the impact of viral disinformation and conspiracy theories and where it comes from the different sources of this bad information. Throughout the pandemic, I've been very busy covering uh, a range of coronavirus conspiracy theories and most recently my attention uh, has been on vaccine disinformation that has been spreading for months and the same narratives reoccur again and again on social media. Um, but it's not just the pandemic, the US election obviously also uh, led to uh, the spread of lots of political disinformation and conspiracy theories on social media. In many ways it was the conspiracy theory election and remains that way. Um, so uh, uh, it's something that I'm, I'm really interested in, the source of this kind of bad information. And, and it's very varied. Uh, one thing we found throughout the pandemic is that there's actually a big difference between the bad actors who deliberately spread disinformation, whether that's for clicks, for money, for political gain, um, for power, and the victims, the people who fall foul to that disinformation, whether it's because it impacts their lives negatively, it destroys relationships, it uh, leads them to some kind of physical, direct or indirect physical harm, um, it results in racist abuse and other really horrible things. Um, but also the people who end up believing this stuff because they are exploited by those bad actors. And those bad actors include uh, pseudoscience influencers, many of which have big followings on YouTube, Twitter, and other social media platforms, um, promoting false claims about 5G being linked to the pandemic, or the suggestion Bill Gates is going to inject a microchip into you, uh, pre-existing anti-vax circles on social media, um, politicians uh, who uh, very much are involved in making disinformation and conspiracy theories go mainstream, and we've seen that happen a lot this year. Um, and then there are also uh, celebrities who are crucial to, again, amplifying conspiracy theories. Lewis Hamilton, Madonna have both been guilty of spreading disinformation about vaccines on Instagram. And then there are the people who are exposed to this stuff. And in many ways, it's important not to kind of brand them nutty or crazy or even conspiracy theorists, but to understand how they are falling foul to this disinformation online. And Mariana, just before we move on from you, um, one sort of we often throw around the words misinformation and disinformation here. What's the difference between the two? The clue is in the first letter. So disinformation means the deliberate spread of misleading information, whereas misinformation is a bit more of a catch-all term. Um, that means anything misleading uh, that's shared. We usually talk about it or certainly I do in the context of the internet and social media misinformation that goes viral online um, and it can be very difficult to work out if something is dis or misinformation because you kind of have to prove intent and that can be very difficult with certain viral posts but like I say often it's the victims of this stuff who are exposed to misinformation in many ways and spread it and the bad actors who spread disinformation. And so if a crystal healer was sort of 
selling you anti-vax information. It would be misinformation if they believed what they were saying and disinformation if they didn't. Yes, exactly. But in many ways, it's very hard to prove that that intent. And so you you, if they were promoting these claims and also making a lot of money about a um, lot of money out of it, then you might be more inclined to think it was disinformation than misinformation. So thanks very much. I'll jump back to this. Um, James, you know, as Mariana was saying, you know, we shouldn't think of people who sort of get suckered into this always as bad people or dupes or people with bad intent. I mean, in your role kind of at LBC, you come into direct contact with people who believe often quite radical or dangerous misinformation. What's that taught you? Um, I've only recently started talking to them. In fact, probably in the last two weeks, I used to have a rule that no anti-vaxxers were allowed on the show because I feared, not necessarily correctly, that, that you inflate their credibility by even acknowledging their existence. But um, given that I used to hold the same approach to the far right and Brexit, I'm, I'm not sure it's been an entirely successful tactic over the last five years or so. So I have started taking calls, not so much from full-on anti-vaxxers, as, as they like to call themselves, but, but more from a sort of broader church of scepticism. And I think the most important thing for the uninitiated to grasp is that they really believe it. So that's why the distinction between misinformation and disinformation is so crucial, because th these are people who believe demonstrable nonsense, but they believe it with a passion and a fervor that I'm afraid does merit the comparison with cult membership and, and the absolute refusal to acknowledge reality, um, which, which is what it is. And, and what I've discovered is that the, the skeleton key to unlocking the absurdity of their position for people listening, not necessarily for the protagonist, is, is just to keep asking why. And those three questions at the heart of any journalist, uh, journalistic inquiry, who, what, why, they can't answer. So, so today I had a very angry, very um, aggrieved man. I mean, sometimes when you've been on the radio for a long time, you have a very personal relationship with your listener, even though you've, you've never met, let alone necessarily even spoken. And, and he clearly felt I had betrayed him or, or let him down by describing him in the ways that I may have described others in the past that he finds as absurd and, and as, as, as ridiculous as I do. But when he was telling me what they were going to do with regard to the digitization of the population and the eradication of the cash from all of society and Bill Gates's master plan to render us all... Um, well, that was it, you see, to render us all what? And, and then why would Bill Gates want to do this? That's where his anger shifted from what you might call righteous to uh, ugly. And, and because he couldn't answer that question, he started getting cross with me. So as with so much that could be filed under having allowed feelings to either trump facts or feelings to assume the same weight and authority as facts, which is, you know, an age-old bugbear of mine in the context of false equivalence and BBC mistaken notions of, of, of balance. When he was pushed to explain why the people he is convinced are up to no good were up to no good, he couldn't. And, you know, you, you don't have to be Columbo to recognise that if you can't identify the motive, it's going to be very hard to prove the crime. Um, one thing I, I wonder, James, is you were sort of talking about the difference between when you've got someone as the person you're speaking to and changing their mind and perhaps then others who are listening. Do you think there's a moment, almost a precipice, where you can pull people back? And I mean, have you? do you think you've ever managed to sort of get no. someone who was at risk of going conspiratorial and stop them? You never know. I, and I, it's, it's so fresh for me, this. I, as I say, it's not, it's not a door I'd ever really opened before. So what we did up until about a fortnight ago was speak to people who loved people who believed it, beginning with the 5G phone masts and the idea that that was somehow designed to, to do us all, all harm. And that was incredibly moving because you heard partners. Today, I actually had a husband on a husband whose wife has, has gone down this route and he is he sounded he sounded heartbroken on air and and 
I, I think if we're going to change any minds, it might be the minds of people who are witnessing rather than engaging, because because the the, the crucible of a of a phone in show is so abnormal, you know, that I don't think anybody they're so adrenalized by the time they get on to me it's similar to what happened with brexit but actually with brexit people did phone in to sort of admit mistakes and to admit and to apologize but with this because it's so i mean mariana's more of an expert than i am on, on what exactly happens to these people but they're so married they're welded even more than wedded they're welded to, to these ideas that the more ridiculous you make them feel, I, I, I fear the angrier they get. But one thing you always have to do when you do what I do for a living is remember that you're not making radio for the person on the end of the phone. And actually, at risk of sounding pompous, you're not doing journalism for the benefit of the one person at the end of the phone. I, I'm, I'm doing journalism or making radio for the benefit of, of you know, over a million people who tune in every week and and i have evidence that i have pulled people back from precipices in that context but the but the the, the moment live on the radio where i've had a a, a full-on bill gates wants to control my mind and drink my child's blood i haven't no i'm gonna have to put my hands up on this because it's all it's all been taped so i have never undertaken a live intervention and, and removed somebody from from from, from danger so, well, yet yet james nice. yet yet <laughs> that's that's your goal for the week james yeah, it's only <laughs> So, speaking of going down a rabbit hole is a great time i think to bring in uh, bronte and um you know, Bronte, you've spent quite a lot of time with people involved in QAnon, which some people sort of on this call may not have heard of, so please do explain that too. But Bronte, QAnon is like a global phenomenon now, it very much started in the USA. Why do you think it's become so pervasive? Why is it pulling people in? And what do you think our role as journalists is with something like this? Yeah, QAnon is a distinctly American set of core beliefs, but because the philosophy, the theory is so uh, nebulous and so ill-defined, it really means that people all over the world can kind of take these core tenets and change them and morph them and add to them to fit their own ideas. So kind of at the core is there this belief that there is a satanic, pedophilic cult of elites that includes liberal politicians um, and celebrities and that they are being dismantled and taken down by President Trump and his allies. Um, it gets its name from Q, who is purportedly a government insider who tells people about uh, and makes these cryptic drops about what President Trump is doing and about all the nefarious activities um, via these that by these cryptic posts so uh, that's kind of the core but really QAnon is so it's so of the internet and for the internet that it's so based on virality so a lot you know there's been elements of the Kennedy assassination you know po you see popping up in QAnon forums so it's it's really this kind of make your own adventure bucket of conspiracy theories. And I think that's why we've seen it spread so far and wide. I think also, you know, uh, American politics to the rest of the world is a bit like a three ring circus. Um, so there is just an entertainment factor there that I, I think makes sense that American politics is in the middle. I mean, we've seen that QAnon has really taken off in a lot of English speaking countries because of that kind of meme ability, um, but also really picked up in Germany. Um, the, the character in that piece that I, that I profiled is Australian, um, and we've seen QAnon sides at uh, you know, rallies in Australia popping up as well. As for what journalists can do, I, I think to what James was saying, it, it's, what, it's what we do best. Call it like it is confront people with facts. I think here there is some compassion needed. As Mariana said, you know, we shouldn't fall into the trap of looking at everybody as a nut job or, you know, a bad person necessarily because they've been attracted to um, what a lot of times their social networks and social media platforms are probably putting in front of them constantly. Um, 
but I think it's really important to tell the personal stories and the personal effects. Um, I've heard from so many people, you know, old family, friends, and neighbors that they have children or spouses that now believe in this and they want help um, and they want to know what they can do. I think, of course, this is confounded by the very contemporary problem that us trying to reach out to these people, especially working at CNN, they quite literally think I'm part of an international plot to destroy their lives. So it really creates a unique situation where uh, sometimes getting access to these people is quite difficult. So Molly, well, good early exclusive for us there. You're uh, denying that you're part of an international plot to uh, destroy lives. Um, more seriously, you have talked to people who used to believe you know, used to follow Q, used to be down that rabbit hole. Did, you know, what did they describe as the reasons they sort of suddenly changed their mind? Because some of the turning points are quite dramatic, aren't they? Yeah, I think it's very personal. Um, I think for a lot of the people, it takes them really taking a moment to look at their own lives and look at how isolated they've become. Um, the fact that they don't have friends or family. Um, I, I've heard people describe it as they become like kind of the crazy person on the street who, who they're so consumed by these theories that it permeates all of their conversations and their relationships. So that isolates them and makes other people not want to necessarily be around them. So I think a lot of times it's looking at the impacts on their own life. Um, to to data who I, who I uh, profiled in that piece said that it was literally that he just he was kind of stopping believing in some of them and he watched one YouTube video and it just broke his trust in the last piece of the puzzle that he believed in and kind of went outside and had a cigarette and said like, look at my life, I'm finished. Um, but I think it's a, a really deeply personal thing that, that probably a lot of times has a lot less to do with the theories and more perhaps with the person's own mental health or with their relationships with people around them. So uh, thanks, that's really interesting. So, um, and I'm going to just introduce our last panelist now, um, John. And John, you've researched the phenomena around misinformation for quite some time and in some real depth. What's sort of the, the findings on what's going on at this level and what's changed now, if anything? And, you know, what's the finding for people trying to operate in this environment, whether they're journalists or whether they're trying to work out who to trust and where to look? Um, well, I, I think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm more of a skeptic, I think, than my fellow panelists. Um, I, I'm always, I'm temperamentally suspicious uh, of anything that mainstream media becomes obsessed with. Um, because uh, I want to know what does that reveal about mainstream media as well as what it what what it reveals about whatever it is they're, they're choosing to look at they're choosing to look at um, and in, in that sense I'm, I'm I, I, I can see that uh, there's, there's there are a set of really interesting stories here uh, and if you're a, a journalist you you have to you follow those because they're, they're naturally interesting and, and when you especially when say uh, in the position of of, uh, of James O'Brien, for example, you you suddenly talking to to uh, what what's what comes over as rather sad people. Um, and and to, to that end, I think that the the best way of thinking about this is probably the cult metaphor. Um, but but the other thing that makes me um, anxious about it is is that um, there's some kind of strange. Um, nostalgic view about golden eras when people believed real things and they took evidence seriously and and so on and I can't ever remember a time like that um, and anybody who's read the Daily Express for the last 30 years would think, <laughs> would, would think wow that's interesting I mean the, the concept of fake news for example seems to me to be um, one that the British public should be really pretty familiar with because we've lived with tabloid newspapers for a long time. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm skeptical about a, a lot of this, um, to be honest. Um, that doesn't mean that this isn't um, 
an interesting phenomenon and it isn't um, a widespread phenomenon and it clearly has something also to do with the way in which our information ecosystem has changed, has been revolutionized in a way um, but by, by online media. But um, I, I would say, to, in answer to the question that somebody raised, what, what can journalists do? I think the first thing I'd recommend is that you go back to what we're good at, which is skepticism. Um, for example, you have to ask a question, say, about, about the, the amazing apparent prevalence of anti-vax conspiracy theories at the moment. Um, there's no question that lots of this stuff circulates on, on, uh, online, but we have really very little hard information about, about it. Uh, for example, I think it's the case that a very small number of, uh, of primal sources for this stuff exist. It isn't, it isn't as though it's everywhere. It is um, um, being, being created and, uh, and originated by a relatively small number of, of, of players. Um, and and th the thing that disturbs me most about it is how little we actually know empirically about this. Um, we, we assume that because um, social media is very prominent in our ecosystem at the moment, um, that for example, everybody sees this terrible stuff that we're all concerned about. And the answer seems to be that they're not. The problem is that we don't have access enough to the kinds of data that would tell us, for example, how many um, people on Facebook actually see uh, something connected with QAnon or with a conspiracy theory or with anti-vax. Uh, the reason we don't know is because they're the only uh, agencies that do know are the, are the platform companies like Facebook, and they're not going to tell us. But th there's, th there's really interesting kind of contradictions in what we think we know about it. And um, it, it may be that this is not the kind of deal that, that, uh, that we are taking it for at the moment. Um, for example, we, we, will, we will find out in due course whether there is any real mileage in the anti-vax stuff. Um, Stan, just wh wh whether individuals will, will actually not take a vaccine because they believe this stuff in the end. We don't know. No, and not. it's an interesting point that you make on that sort of, you know, there is a case for scepticism. The media has got into moral panics before, but surely it's sort of fairly indisputable that at the moment the stakes of this stuff are somewhat higher. If you're in a sort of actual mm. pandemic situation, yeah. and we have seen online movements able to mobilise street protests, mobilise anti-mask protests, lead to physical actions against 5G barriers. It, it feels like the world's a bit more febrile for this stuff at the moment. And so maybe it's simmering at the same levels as before, but it does feel like we're seeing the observable real world consequences, certainly more than we have in quite some time. Would you not, I think would you not agree? I think, I think that's true. But, but where, we're, where, where I fear we may be making a mistake is in thinking that um, the, the communications media that we that now dominate our, our, our universe are in fact the causal factors in it. I would say that in many cases, um, social media, just to take one, one particular example, is a necessary but not sufficient condition for explaining what's happening to our world. Okay. Other things are driving it. And this technology enables uh, things to happen that make it worse, but they're not the prime causes of it. So, um, cool. Well, thanks very much, John. So we are getting absolutely tons of questions in chat. So I'm actually going to jump into those and save some of my own for a little bit later. Um, I think I'll open for one for anybody who would like it, which is from, I do apologize if I pronounce anyone's names wrong, by the way. Um, from Chris Schuler, um, which is, are there any factors we are aware of that might predispose people to believing in conspiracy theories? Are there any sort of warning signs? Yeah. yeah I just, I, oh, sorry. No, you I go ahead, Marianne. You can. You go ahead. I don't mind. Go, go. Uh, all I'd say is that when, when we, we had a big um, 
six year research project on conspiracy theories and democracy. And the, the one thing we decided to do at the beginning was we were not going to go into the area of, of why do people believe this stuff? Um, because that's the province of um, psychiatrists and, and, and social psychologists and other things. So we left it alone. Um, and it's, I think it's a big question and it's worth exploring and people have explored it, but not us. Yeah, to, to that point, I, I, I think um, I kind of quite strongly believe that that in order to cover viral disinformation and conspiracy theories effectively, it's not just about the fact checks or presenting evidence. It is about trying to understand things like this. Who's susceptible to this stuff? Who's impacted the real world consequences that are felt um, and uh, the impact it's having on our world? And I think in terms of I've spoken to a number of people, um, either who have relatives who have gone down the rabbit hole or um, uh, who themselves uh, previously believed conspiracy theories, and that's no longer the case, or or still do. Um, and there are some re there are some kind of reoccurring th themes, I guess, that come up. One is distrust, particularly distrust of authority. I interviewed this rapper uh, who, well, self-proclaimed rapper from Canada. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, he has a very good song called "Bill Gates Will Kill You" uh, on YouTube. If anyone wants to listen, um, and uh, he said. That uh, I started talking to him. He was a really nice guy. Uh, he ran this huge vaccine conspiracy theory Facebook group called Collective Action Against Bill Gates, which in many ways has been responsible for um, the spread of vaccine disinformation far beyond that group in local Facebook groups, in um, parent Facebook groups, chat, Instagram, everywhere else. And uh, I spoke to him and we started to get to the bottom of why he turned to conspiracy theories and one of those reasons was uh, he'd gone through care his entire life he was really distrustful of those in charge he'd had some really bad experiences when he was little not being very uh, not being very well um, upset with the way that doctors and nurses had handled that situation and so to me it really struck me that he was distrustful of those in charge he was also very lonely he was very anxious about the pandemic um, and he was turning to social media for answers and I think those are some of the really common attributes um, for the people who fall foul to this kind of disinformation, although he then went on to be a super spreader of vaccine disinformation. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, I recently did an interview with the son of uh, one of the leaders of Britain's conspiracy theory community. Uh, his name is Sebastian Shemarani. His mum, Kate, is a nurse who was struck off uh, for spreading harmful conspiracy theories and disinformation about the pandemic. She's one of the headliners at the anti-lockdown rallies. And uh, uh, he spoke to me about attributes that his mum uh, demonstrates. He says that she's someone who always really enjoyed the attention that came with uh, spreading these kinds of conspiracy theories, the popularity, the fame in many ways. And I think that's a big driver of this stuff. And social media certainly exacerbates that problem. Um, so kind of like I said at the beginning, I think that there are a range of characteristics that people demonstrate. And in many ways, that tells you whether they're a follower or a leader in this disinformation ecosystem. Uh, that's really fascinating. Thanks, Mariana. Uh, unless anyone wants to chip in on this, I'm going to jump to. I'd add, I'd add one word, <clears throat> which, which which is belonging, and and it, it's weird. This has never occurred to me before, but 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 listening to my fellow panelists, I, I, I regularly interview very famous people for a podcast that I do, and I have a, a question that I love, which is, did, is that when you found your tribe? Because we all, or most of us, go through life sometimes feeling a bit disconnected, a little bit unappreciated, un unvalued. Um, but I'd never realized, actually, until just now, that when you get 200 likes, or 2,000 likes, or 200,000 likes, suddenly you feel validated and, and you have a sense of belonging that you haven't been able to find anywhere else in your life. So my experience is slightly different from Bronte's in that the people I speak to weren't necessarily uh, lonely or, 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 I mean, they had partners and they had family. And I had a mother today whose daughter has gone down despite having a very loving mother, but, but they, they, it's almost as if, and then they start boasting online about how they've been abandoned by their families because QAnon is the tribe, the, 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 the gang, the sense of belonging that they have discovered and and like john I, I use the c word very very freely when it comes to these sort of conversations because the the closest you can come to is is, is a cult so so i think that sense of belonging is something those of us who are not feeling disassociated and disconnected from from the real world struggle to fully appreciate 
do you think perhaps, James, those quite strong tribes, if they create, then leave themselves prone to radicalizing each other? Because, you know, Remainer was not a strong tribal identity in the UK <laughs> four years ago. Telling me, that was and, one of the uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to say what what gets quite dismissively referred to as FBPE now mm. is an incredibly strong online tribe and has some quite conspiratorial beliefs. Oh yes, 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 yes. Two way street going on there. No, no, no one has the monopoly. No one has a monopoly on 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 rightness. I, I never really got my head around the FBPE stuff, but the um the the, the notion that once you have got your membership card but probably similar to religion than any assault. It's, it's like you can say what you like. I, I can say what I like about my family, but if you in insult or criticize my family, then, then we're going to have some serious beef. And if you can extend that concept of family into everybody who believes what I currently believe, then you have a sort of ring fencing of, of um, conviction that is, is profoundly dangerous. And yes, of course, people who I might agree with about some issues are just as susceptible to it. To that, what would you call it? Intoxic I think it's quite an intoxicating experience, actually. And, and I do think, although John's right to say that none of this is box fresh, none of this is brand new, what the internet has done, describe it as a catalyst rather than a cause, and I think you get a little bit closer to understanding the zeitgeist. Sorry, James, uh, the only thing is... is um, is is that we, we, we kind of tend to patronize people who believe conspiracy theories. But what else can you do, John? If, I mean, I take calls from people who believe that there are tunnels under London full of yeah. kidnapped children whose blood is going to be harvested so that Bill exactly. Gates and Tom Hanks, it's not funny. I mean, I used to laugh. No. And if you'll forgive me, when you spoke earlier, I thought that's where I was about six months ago. What word would you use to describe how you should talk to people who believe that there are tunnels under London full of kidnapped children whose blood is going to be harvested to provide Tom Hanks with an elixir of youth? I, I don't have it's an answer. That, that, I, I, sorry, I don't have an answer. What, what I meant was that... Um, we we who belong in privileged bubbles like like we do well every everybody on this everybody on this call belongs to a kind of a bubble uh, it, it's privileged in a way we we feel we have agency and so on but the, the point i was really trying to make is that sometimes conspiracy theories are an attempt by people to make sense of a world they find really confusing yes of course right but, but sometimes they are, and, and this time they are. But still, if I am talking to somebody who believes that Bill Gates is seeking to inject them with a, with a, with, with a nano chip that will allow him to extinguish their existence at the sure. flick of a switch, I, I make no apology if I come across as patronizing because these people well, are, are, are dangerously deluded. No, I, didn't, I didn't mean that you were patronizing. I was, I was thinking that, for example, from the experience we had as a group of academics studying this subject, right. Um, we, 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 were, we were constantly um, regarded by our colleagues, our academic peers, mm. as being kind of, well, why are you wasting your time on this stuff? It's of no account. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and the, the, the point is that um, when, when, you, when, you, when you meet um, many people who are, who are conspiracist in their thinking, um, what, what you're finding is, is attempts to try and make sense of something. They're usually excluded minorities. For example, they don't belong to any of these kind of uh, privileged circles that we belong to. Um, they, 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 in many cases, are excluded from a, a lot of what now happens in terms of mainstream society and so on. And and uh, it's an attempt to make sense of it. It's it's what um, philosophers call an epistemological device. Now it it happens often to be a crippled epistemology because it's immune to evidence. That's one. But, but um, anybody who's ever dealt with, re with religious fanatics, for example, is also dealing with somebody who is impervious to evidence and so on. So I, what, we, what, what I think is, would, would be a more pos positive approach to this would be to say, this is an extreme case. These kind of conspiracy theories that you are experiencing in your, in your, in, in your uh, phone-in, um, these are the, the very extreme case of a much more general tendency to be skeptical about received wisdom, to be feel that there that one is excluded from from what is going on in the society. How how on earth can you understand, for example, if you're living 
in in a in a tier three um, uh, part of the country at the moment that these decisions that were made that are affecting your life were made by people who know what they're doing and who care for your interests and so on. So you make up, you, you then construct a narrative which, which explains it for you. And it happens to be a conspiracist one. And that, that doesn't mean that it's right, or, but it's, it, it's, it's an understandable reaction of human beings to being excluded in many cases. And then it, become, it does become pathological as well. Is that, so, not, is that not a bit patronizing? The, the, well, I'm an academic, the, I suppose, but I'm, I'm, Well, I'm, these people have ended up believing complete bonkers because they don't enjoy the privilege that we enjoy. I ever talk to uh, religious fanatics? Oh, yes, I went to Ampleforth. <laughs> ah, okay. I was brought up in a Catholic country, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, oh, just really quickly on, on that point, I think, I think that, John, you make a really important point that empathy is key when... Um, talking to people about conspiracy theories and understanding why they've turned to them. And absolutely, I think that the approach of kind of being dismissive or patronizing doesn't work. But at the same time, kind of, I, I agree with both perspectives because I think that you also should never accept this as a kind of like a matter of opinion. It, it's fact and it should be called that way. And there are so many instances of direct harm, whether it's to relationships, whether it's to uh, people's lives. I've interviewed a man who lost his wife because they believed that coronavirus uh, they believe disinformation about coronavirus on Facebook um, and the consequences were really devastating. And, and I also think actually that the prevalence of these, this disinformation and conspiracy theories is huge. And I think in many ways, it's something that we will come to realize we underestimated because so many people I speak to, and, it, and although it's incredibly difficult to quantify, so many people I speak to anecdotally, whether that's people whose families have been affected, just the comment sections in local Facebook, and parent forums it's just incredibly prevalent and although these conspiracies may seem quite extreme i actually don't think that these are that extreme cases i think there are a lot of people i went on the jeremy vine show today and uh, in the half an hour that i was on the program we received tens of calls emails text messages from really quite average people who were listening to radio 2 and who believed that bill gates was going to inject microchips that they were going to come to harm uh, because of a vaccine and lots of really harmful disinformation spreading online and i think the problem is it's incredibly hard to quantify how prevalent this is but i just think we shouldn't underestimate that we all can sit here and be like that sounds a bit out there but actually it, it's not yes, absolutely and i would just add in terms of real world effects i mean we have you know actual actual organizations that deal with child abuse telling us that their phone lines are so overwhelmed with people who believe in QAnon talking about why don't you go get Tom Hanks that they're actually missing you know calls from children in harm's way in the US we've had multiple candidates run who've toyed with the idea of QAnon who've spoken about it and some of them were elected so i think you know we we are seeing when we talk about real world effects i think um, i think they're happening so Bronte, can um, can I just put another sort of question from the audience uh, to you? Sorry to put you on the spot, um, but Chanel Montaigne um, has sort of asked if anyone's been able to trace conspiracy theories back to any particular disinformation actors. Um, you know, are some of the ones that are going around at the moment things that we can link to state-sponsored sort of action or that kind of thing, or is that itself starting to be sort of conspiratorial thinking and she also asked separately you know is is the dark web playing a role in this or is this regular internet well i think to talk about the first the second part of that question i i, I do think like what we've seen with QAnon is that you know these posts were popping up on aqn and sites like that and then they would kind of travel and almost get digested by and and that's kind of the fun of QAnon is I think it, you know, we're talking about what makes it attractive. I think if you're maybe a person whose intelligence perhaps doesn't feel valued and you think you have something to contribute, you can say, oh, I'll take three lines of a post and I'll tell you how to interpret them and I'll use numerology and I'll use this and make these connections. And I think it can be a really intellectually stimulating exercise to say, I'm going to decipher this and I'm going to show people. And then when people agree with your interpretations, um, I would assume that that probably feels very validating too. So I think a lot of times what we see is with QAnon is especially that these posts, these drops from Q kind of will pop up. People I've spoken to have said, 
who believed in QAnon, like they don't really even know how to access parts of the internet where these things are first appearing, but that they'll kind of, as I said, get digested and become more mainstream and become more easily readable. And um, whatever this cryptic text is, will get turned into kind of a, a blanket understanding, a more easily understood thing rather than the cryptic way it first appeared. Um, there's multiple theories about who Q could be. I, I don't know <laughs> um, the truth behind any of those. Um, but I, I think they kind of have a way of permeating and becoming more mainstream. And now we're seeing a backlash actually away from the mainstream with this feeling that um, many of these believers are being censored by platforms like Facebook and turning to Parler, Gab, platforms like that, that kind of have this um, guise of a free speech mission um, that they don't moderate or have the rules that other more mainstream social platforms do. There is a sort of interesting propagation between very fringe sites and then it jumps to Facebook and that's when these things seem to go big, isn't it? I, I wonder uh, whether there's also a propagation or, or even a sort of osmosis of respectability with, with other areas. So if, if you can talk abject nonsense about climate science and have a column in the Daily <laughs> Telegraph or, or, or a regular berth in the Spectator magazine, then why should someone who's posting what we know to be abject nonsense about vaccines on their Facebook page be looked down on or or sneered at. You, you, you have this curious, you, you know, for me, a lot of the uh, assault upon objective truth, which I think Obama calls truth decay in his new book, you trace it back for me to, to the climate science debates and uh, oddly the MMR scandal that, that yeah, uh, yeah. Andrew Wakefield launched. And if, if people like that, you know, Andrew Wakefield, I, I believe in America, still enjoys a degree of celebrity and is going out with, a, with, with, with somebody famous and back here, having been categorically, even being humiliated on national television for your ignorance about climate science and things like that, doesn't prevent you from still cashing checks off the Barclay brothers on, on, on the Spectator or on the Telegraph. So I agree with John on that sense that it's packed because, you know, if, if you've got a column, then you're somehow respectable. And if you're punting absolute nonsense on a Facebook page, then you're somehow beneath contempt that there's a problem there that is to do with mainstream rather than social media. I, was, I was going to say to push on that point james it to either to you or to anyone who would want to jump on there is a huge habit among those of us who work in mainstream media of talking about misinformation as a problem of <clears throat> social media or of fringe people or of alternative media and we do publish a lot of it and perhaps yeah, even more shocking than wakefield still being on the scene the journal editors who published him and stood by him in the scientific journals are still employed now at prestigious journals. But they've resiled from they've resiled from their support for him, haven't they? Only very, very meekly, actually. This they've, is more, they've more, more field, field of expertise. They would like to publish him. Okay. Um, which is interesting. Yeah, that's scary. That's very scary. Um, and so we do really have a habit of wanting consequences for everyone but ourselves here, don't we? It's a brilliant point. Yes, we do. So um, I'm going to jump on a question from Robin Lustig, um, which is, do the panelists think it would help at all if Facebook, YouTube, Instagram were far tougher on muting or banning people who propagate this stuff? Um, and I will add to that question, would that be worth the cost on free speech and on sort of public exchange? Can I come in on that, please? Please do. Um, I, I think um, there's no there's there's no good option here in that sense because if 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 we um, if we pressure uh, these organisations to, um, to to somehow jump on 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 stuff that we regard as being pernicious conspiracy theories misinformation or whatever then we are effectively as societies subcontracting to a small number of, of private companies. Um, the, the determination of what gets published and what's not. So it, 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 we're ceding to them a kind of sovereignty that we really ought to, ought to uh, hold for our, our territorial sovereigns, our, our parliaments or our courts. Um, but that's, 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 one, uh, that's, that's one side of it. But the other thing that doesn't seem to me to be um, discussed enough is, is the expectations we have of, of 
certain of these tech companies. Um, and I think it, it goes back to a basic misconception we have, which is that somehow a, a commercial company, um, like say Facebook, um, it may be indeed staffed by many people who, who are basically good human beings. Um, and therefore we're astonished when it, it does terrible things. What we're ignoring is the fact that um, corporations are essentially intrinsically sociopathic. They do what they do because of their purposes. Um, Facebook could be run by, by, uh, by, by St. Augustine and it would still behave the way it, uh, it, it behaves because its fundamental business model depends on, on monetizing uh, user engagement. And user engagement, it turns out, because of the frailties and other characteristics of human beings, means that we are more interested in crap than we are in good stuff, broadly speaking, and we mm -hmm. engage with it more. So to expect Facebook to turn off the tap that produces those colossal revenues and that, and that very big margin is kind of unrealistic. Um, yes, I, I think I think there's there's always very interesting questions of balance here, and the governments perhaps are too willing to throw huge decisions to private companies here. And they don't they don't have to they don't have to do that. So I can't, no, probably, they don't. I can't, I can't work, regulate this. No, precisely. So I, I, I first of all I can't believe I'm part of a conversation in which the word sovereignty has been deployed with both understanding and evidence. That's a very refreshing experience after the last. Uh, a couple of years, but but you, you, you can. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about being very active on Twitter is that you realise that other territories have other rules. So in the context of a complaint on Twitter, if you submit a complaint in Germany, the process is different from what you would experience if you submitted a complaint in the United Kingdom. Simple things like whether or not the account you're complaining about gets told about the fact that you've, you've complained. Um, and I speak as someone... I don't think I've ever complained about someone else, but I get complained about a lot. And the, the different territories have different rules. So yes, these are massive uh, pantechnicons of, of, of technology, but actually I think you could have national sovereignty and say, if you're going to publish, which is what they are, however much they pretend otherwise, if you're going to publish in the UK, these are the rules. And, and the broader, bigger business model can be sustained while the responsibility of, 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 of not allowing lies to get halfway around the world before the truth has got its trousers on could be taken by governments. But as ever, the technology is understood by the people running the technology companies, not by the people running the countries. I suspect it's also easier in a lot of cases for the government to go, Twitter should do more to handle extremist content yes. and never have to define it in law. But James, I've actually got a question for you from Dorothy Byrne, um, which I think relates to you sort of saying, you didn't used to put people on air because of worrying about amplification, mm. which has been a concern for Dorothy as commissioner too. Um, but she asks them, um, does James think by letting people even mention conspiracy theories, he's unfortunately helping them to spread them? Is it worse than ignoring them? She, uh, I worry that the conspiracy theories about COVID-19 vaccines will result in people dying. And I'd well, maybe be interested in hearing from Mariana afterwards about amplification. I, I, I mean, I, I've, I, I'm on a bit of a journey here. As I said earlier, I haven't let them on um, until relatively recently, and I still don't let on. So today, the closest we got to it was someone, well, I've taken all the other vaccines. I've given all the other vaccines to my children, but I'm worried about, about this one. And then, then, yeah, today we did move on to, to, to letting people come on or inviting people to come on and explain who, what, and why. But they couldn't. So I do worry, yes, that, that even by acknowledging their existence, um, you give some credibility to their arguments. But, but on a very personal level, both in my job and in my life, I think I got it wrong about the far right. I think, you know, we should have pointed at them and laughed or we should have engaged and undermined but to ignore or to say you're not allowed on my show because you're clearly, you know, a, 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 an ignorant bigot was probably a mistake. And so I am a very much in a sort of place of contemplation at the moment, thinking if I, to coin a phrase, if I dismantle you live on the radio, does that help the bigger picture or does that prove that I'm part of the 
conspiracy? I don't have the answer to that question yet. I, I may never have the answer to that question, but she's quite right that people will die because of the lies that are out there. So I suspect that you have to at least have a crack at, at, at the lies. I, I think you probably do, don't you? Yeah, and I, I think I'd like to sort of throw it out to Marianne, Mariana and Rob Shea, if you'd like to come in after, of course, please do. But, you know, I, I remember I, I had conversations with editors at Nationals and actually with people at the TV trying to get them to cover QAnon maybe about two years ago and saying, this is getting to millions of people already. You know, in some cases, this has bigger outlet than your circulation. You're not amplifying it. You're letting it go unchecked. And often losing those arguments for people making the very reasonable case that put something out to a million people and some of them will believe it. Now, obviously, you know, Marianne, you're a disinformation reporter at the BBC. Your job seems to be handling that debate. How have you been having that? You know, well, you know, where do you fall on it? What's, you know, what is the BBC rule on it? Absolutely. Uh, uh, amplification is something that is discussed about every single bit of reporting that I do. And as you can imagine, uh, really rigorously. Um, but the, the overarching view is that if something is viral enough, if it has reached enough people, it's wrong for us to ignore it. And that's not doing our job as good journalists if we just pretend something isn't happening because we're a bit worried about covering it. Uh, because it is happening, as you say, often reaching more people than even some BBC programmes reach and certainly a lot of the media reach. Um, and in fact, investigating it, revealing its sources, exposing its impact um, uh, is, is a better way of, of covering it than just pretending it doesn't exist. Obviously, if something isn't very viral or um, isn't something that's picking up a lot of traction, we tend to avoid it. But most of the conspiracy theories that have uh, been spread during the pandemic and during the US election are ones which are really, really viral and having real world consequences, whether it's direct harm, whether it's protests um, and things like that. Um, I mean, the fact that I exist, the fact that the BBC has a specialist disinformation reporter shows you what a big deal this beat has become. It's become it's something that, that the US has is, is far ahead of uh, us on. Um, CNN, uh, New York Times, uh, NBC, uh, BuzzFeed all have brilliant dedicated correspondents and reporters covering this beat because it's an entirely different beat to, uh, it, it's not just the same as the tech beat, which, uh, you know, tech correspondents have a gazillion things to cover. Th this in itself is, is huge um, and the ramifications it has are massive. And so I, I think that, um, I think firstly, you have to assess how viral something is and whether it's worth covering. And then once you reach that point, it's about how you cover it. And we're really careful when we report on these areas, how we tackle them, the headlines we use, the way that we approach them. When I do lives, I'm really careful always to make sure that I differentiate between legitimate concerns about vaccines and uh, important questions that people have, the ability to criticize the government and to scrutinize what's going on, and then really quite extreme and outlandish conspiracy theories which which are totally different i also tend to focus in my reporting on those impacted because i think they are the most powerful way of exposing the consequence of viral disinformation whether it's the interview i did with sebastian uh, shemarani or um there was a great guy called momo who was an anti-racism protester who received awful racist abuse online because he was targeted with false claims from far right uh, accounts and pages um uh, and you know, the disinformation has, has a wide range of consequences. Brian, who I mentioned, who lost his wife as a consequence of viral disinformation. And I, 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 one thing we find is that those kinds of stories are incredibly popular on the BBC website. They get millions of hits, almost as many as our explainers and other kind of news about coronavirus. And I think that in itself not only reveals uh, the interest in and the importance of this topic, the fact that a lot of people are coming across it in their day to day lives on their social media feeds, far more than some of the other stuff that we write about, um, but also that um, that we hopefully therefore are reaching people who perhaps could have fallen foul to this stuff uh, with stories and uh, journalism that exposes the danger it poses. I got a cab back from uh, work sort of in peak pandemic and um, uh, the taxi driver who was was driving said to me oh um we were talking about the pandemic and he said oh i've been seeing some stuff on social media and i sort of thought 
like I kind of don't, didn't think this thing was real. I sort of haven't been taking it seriously. I think it's a bit of a hoax, to be honest. I'm seeing all this stuff about 5G. Um, and before I could even interrupt him, he said, but then I read a thing on the BBC uh, yesterday. It was actually through my Apple News. And it was about a man who lost his wife because of disinformation they'd seen on social media. They didn't follow health guidance. Um, and it really upset me. And I shared it with all my family. And I thought, this is awful. It's really important. I didn't realize how much this mattered. And that, for me, was, was the best possible outcome for the reporting I do. But I think it shows you that it's better that we're ahead of the game, that we report on this stuff rigorously and uh, in an original way than just pretend it doesn't exist because it does. What a fantastic moment. That's a uh, very, very, very rare so journalist. So I was like, oh, it's oh, the right dream. <laughs> but, but Mariana, but Mariana can, I, can I just ask one thing, which is um, how, do, how do we know that stuff that we think of as going viral is actually going viral? So there are lots um, of different tools. There are lots of different tools that we, we use. Um, in my team, especially, we work with some brilliant journalists at BBC Monitoring, um, who speak a variety of languages and spend their time monitoring what's going on online. Uh, we use things like Crowd Tangle, Spread Fast, um, joining lots and lots of Facebook groups, uh, uh, scouring often just by hand through um, different pages on Instagram. Um, but Crowd Tangle especially is very, very useful because it allows us to see how viral a particular term has gone, how big uh, certain Facebook groups are. I'm currently working on a story that's about a uh, dodgy GoFundMe page that's gone viral because uh, a lady claimed she was injured in a, the Pfizer vaccine trial. And obviously uh, it's been shared tens of thousands of times in vaccine conspiracy theory circles, uh, including in Romanian, Polish, as well as English and, and in the US. Um, and obviously it's really hard to quantify how many people who see that go on to uh, go on to believe what they're seeing. But given that we can see how many people go on to share it or reshare the same ideas, we can assume that some of those who are exposed to it and see it, which we can tell from various engagement statistics, at least might have a uh, kind of seed of doubt sown in their, sown in their minds. And, and as we've said lots of times, often the bad information tends to go very viral and yeah. debunks or the kind of truth much less viral. I mean, I, all of that I, I, I accept. But my, my question really is um, about actually how many people really see this stuff, even when it's viral. Because there's some very confusing stuff here. I mean, there was a great piece of, of research done after the 2016 election of Donald Trump um, by, by a group of people at Stanford. And, and one of the things they, 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 they claim to have found from their surveys and other things is that almost nobody in the United States actually saw anything that was politically relevant on their Facebook feeds, I think, on their social media feeds. And, and they got most of their information from cable TV and other conventional sources. So, um, and then there was a, something the other day where, where on the one hand, Charlie, uh, Char I think it was Charlie Warzel in the New York Times, he, he got permission from two people who are, quote, ordinary people, i.e. non-journalists, if, if he could look at their Facebook page for, for uh, their Facebook feeds for, for, for three weeks, and then he discovered the kind of stuff that horrifies um, uh, us. Uh, on, on these on these feeds. On the other hand, somebody else had the idea, I think, in, in uh, which was reported in the Columbia Journalism Review, which is they, they got um, they used um, Amazon Turk to get an awful lot of people to to tell them what was appearing in their feeds, and actually almost none of it was any of the stuff we're talking about. So all I'm trying to say is that we don't really know, I don't think, um, what virality really means in terms of its impact. We, we know that uh, a lot of people retweet on, tw on Twitter, for example. That's a fact we can, we, we can say, except that the Twitter sphere is not actually re the real world. It's something else. So all I'm saying is that I, my feeling is that we are too, as journalists, we are too ready to use virality as, a, as if it were an unquestionable um, measure of importance and reach and power. And the only people who know, actually, are the people who run the, 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 the platforms. 
I so agree with you that the lack of transparency is, 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 is definitely a problem. Um, but I do think that uh, virality isn't just about like the, just about those numbers. I mean, I've, I've perhaps misunderstood your question a little bit, but virality is also about all of that anecdotal evidence. And I cannot tell you the amount of messages, emails, uh, everything that I get on a day to day basis of people promoting this kind of disinformation. And it's not the same people, it's different people. And I think what's crucial is people don't have a social media feed that is chock a block with, I mean, some of them do, the people who are really on the fringes will might have a social media feed that is entirely QAnon or that is entirely entirely coronavirus conspiracy theories but a lot of people will just have social media feeds that are punctuated with this stuff and the issue with passive consumption is that people scroll through they see something it, they kind of think oh that's a bit weird about bill gates oh, i'll keep scrolling um oh there's a, that's another weird thing about bill gates oh maybe there is something about bill gates i was quite recently um uh, and i i can't kind of stress how frequently these things have happened how frequently these people get in touch with me how frequently people everybody i talk to has a relative or a friend or somebody whether that's someone i actually know or someone who's just reached out to me who has been impacted by these conspiracy theories i was filming a report for the 10 o'clock news outside top shop on oxford uh, by oxford circus um, and these two blokes walked by they're in their late 20s and uh, they shouted something like, Bill Gates is going to kill us with a vaccine. This was this was in the summer. Uh, and I thought, oh, my gosh, they know who I am. That's so cool. They didn't. <laughs> 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 um, I'm going to uh, jump in here just as uh, we have amazingly actually already used our allotted oh, no. hour. So I'm going to have to try and wrap us up. But I would like just to give everyone a very quick last chance to say, and I wanted to, to try and end us on a positive or a constructive note. So I'll let everyone pick the order that they go in. But if people could pick one thing that either they could do or someone else could do or journalists could do to improve the information ecosystem, it doesn't even have to be to tackle misinformation, but one constructive thing either as a user, as a journalist, or something to campaign for. Uh, anyone want to go first? I've got a good idea. We should switch off Facebook. <laughs> that would work. So we've got switch off Facebook. So who's next? I, I go broader, if I may, on the whole of, of the assault upon honesty and objectivity. And I, I don't think any mainstream broadcaster should accept contributions from anybody whose funding isn't clear. Um, it, it's not obviously a problem in the context of the conversation we've been having. But the idea that you can work for a so-called think tank or an educational charity that is invited onto the BBC 300 times a week without anybody actually having the right to know who's paying your wages is absolutely ridiculous, deeply dangerous, and almost certainly corrupting our democracy. So I should probably disclose at this point that among the Bureau's major funders uh, is in fact the Gates Foundation uh, and Open Society foundations and we are very grateful for their support and um, we know and we know that they fund you yes oh yes but i just felt for the people on the call uh you oh, know, yes. maybe, but, maybe but, i would but, say that. <laughs> that the same does not apply for the taxpayers alliance for example no they do not disclose that yeah. um so or, or, or the institute i could go on at this point and yeah, listen, yeah. I, but, <laughs> but that, that has to be the biggest problem in, in british journalism at the moment uh, mine, would be a more, mine would be a more general point that I, I think there, there's reason to be hopeful and it's that the very things that allow disinformation to thrive, whether it's people kind of investigating things themselves and feeling kind of empowered um, or people people being kind of hyper engaged in the world around them, uh, people being interested in, in, in stories that are emotive, that attract their attention. I think we can weaponize all of those things in order to tackle this problem and to report on it effectively as, as journalists. And, and I think that's a really positive thing because I think it tells us that this is something that uh, hopefully can kind of be overcome. I mean, we've seen it happen whenever there's a change to the information ecosystem, whether it was the arrival of the TV or radio or, uh, or print um, and and I think it's something that will be kind of hard uh, and I think it will take a while to pass but I think that we should be hopeful that I mean I spend a lot of my time talking to BBC Newsround uh, and uh, trying to educate kids on how they can spot this information and it makes me think that perhaps I just won't exist and <laughs> that would be a good thing. <laughs> I think to that point, skepticism and, and kind of what Mariana was saying that the conspiracy theories really are skepticism against mainstream conventional wisdom. And, and what we need is more skepticism towards 
you know, facts like reading facts like reading Bill Gates is trying to put a microchip into you. We need skepticism all around. Um, and I think that's something that maybe as journalists is some, a, a, you know, a muscle that's well trained in us, um, but that we can always do better at as well. So I think the, there's a real opportunity here, I think, for us as journalists to find purpose um, and to do service here um, by reporting this information. I think it's also really easy to get wrapped up in the drama that we're condemning, right? If I have a headline that says like, cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles, that's me doing the same thing they're doing. Um, so I, I think it takes a lot of restraint, um, but it's, it's a real challenge that uh, I think journalists have a role in. So uh, great, thank you very much. So just some quick thank yous from me. Firstly to absolutely everyone in the audience and especially everyone who asked a question. I'm so sorry I didn't get to more of them. They were just fantastic and so much to run at with this. And then of course, a very special thank you to our absolutely fantastic panel who that absolutely flew by. I, I still think it's a conspiracy. We only got 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so um, with that, I will just very quickly go to um, our president, Peter York, for some quick closing remarks on behalf of the Media Society. Peter, you're on mute. Unmute. Hold on. It takes a lot to meet me. Um, wasn't that completely brilliant? and thoughtful, calling for empathy for people in those curious cult situations, calling to cut off information suppliers with unclear funding. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you to our marvellous panellists again, and to our brilliant chair, James Ball. Now, if you like that, there's more where it came from. So, for instance, we're organising our f first event for next year right now. It's, what, it's about what media should be like when this lousy war is over. We've got some panellists lined up and more to secure. But most of all, we want to hear your ideas about the global media ecology and the UK media ecology. What should be put right? What have we learnt over the last year? What do we want to change? What do we want more of? Revolutions happen when things are getting that bit better after terrible times. It's a classic proven historical trajectory. Send your ideas to us and tell us who you'd like to hear discussing them. Now is the time, I'm afraid, when I start begging for money. The Media Society is a small, mainly volunteer-run charity. Our income has come from a combination of membership subscriptions, events, awards, dinners, things like that. And it's been hit, like every other small charity has, by the pandemic. We don't get any public or any private money. We'd absolutely love to be sponsored, but our sponsors won't have to be really squeaky clean. So I'm asking now that everyone who isn't a member should become a member. And if you're already a member, make sure you subscribe again when the time comes. And as a new member, you can help us by subscribing for three years or forever, for a lifetime. See the options on our site. Check it out. And if you want to send us a ton of gold in a truck, <laughs> we'd love to see that too. Just so we can go on producing events like tonight's. Thank you.